Hello, my name is John Beecham and I've been very kindly asked by the Warsaw Rising Museum here in Warsaw to conduct one of the first interviews in English as part of the Roots of Memory project, which is run by the museum. I'm very pleased to have with me here in the studio, which is in fact the library here at the Warsaw Rising Museum, a television sports journalist who goes by the name of Joanna Gonszorowska Brandl. Hi there. Hi. So, a nice uh, double barreled name, Gonszorowska. So, obviously, you have uh, Polish roots, and it's uh, fantastic to, to have you here. Thank you for coming because you've come quite a long way, haven't you? Yes, well, I live now in Qatar. I grew up in London, but as you said, I, I do have Polish roots. So, you know, both my parents are Polish, and we're here to talk about my grandmother, who uh, was the one who was fighting in the Warsaw Uprising. Exactly. Now, your grandmother was called Irena Czapinska, uh, and she also had uh, two pseudonyms, right? Uh, so, Ita and uh, Huba. Mm -hmm. uh, and before we get on to what your grandmother was like, uh, I wanted to start with uh, the fact that you told us uh, in the questionnaire which you wrote for uh, the Roots of Memory project here at the Rising Museum, that you wear a ring uh, which was once worn by your grandmother. Uh, can, you, can you show it to, yeah, to us, please? Yeah, absolutely. So this is the ring that my babcha, uh, Ita, who, in fact, she went by that pseudonym oh, for the right, rest okay. of her life. She mm -hmm. was Ita. She wore this ring. Uh, until she died and I keep it on my finger just because I really feel so close to her you know she was such a big part of my life and such an influence on the way I live my life and, and how I see the world that I just like to keep her close. Exactly I mean I wanted to ask uh, how you feel when you wear the ring right so you said that you it obviously keeps your grandmother close to you but when you think about it going deeper inside, I mean, how do you feel about the relationship you had with your grandmother and how you feel when you wear this ring? What kind of emotions co go through you? I love my grandmother very, very much. She was such a wonderful person. She was very proud, intelligent. Uh, she loved life. And I really, I hope that when I wear this ring, it reminds me to sort of embody that. You know, even in difficult times, when you have difficult moments in your life, I try and think of what my babcha would say to me or what my babcha would do in this sort of situation. And she always said yes to every opportunity. She always sort of went for it. She never, she never sort of seemed sad about anything. She was a, she was really, you know, took life by the kind of, gripped it hard and just kept going. And I, and I just, really hope that whatever I do that she's so proud of what I do you know because of the influence that she's had on me. Yes of course and we'll get on to that later on in the interview. Um, first of all though I wanted to ask what are your first memories uh, of your grandmother of your babcha and of course I'd like to remind viewers that we'll be using this term babcha quite a lot during this interview uh, so for those of you that don't know Polish uh, babcha means grandmother and we'll be repeating this <laughs> word quite a lot mm. right so your babcha what are your first memories of her I always like to think of my babcha as waiting for me after a long car journey from London to, to Warsaw she used to wait at the top of the stairs in her apartment block. She was on the second floor and we'd always arrive at late in the evening. Uh, it would be cold outside, but she'd wait in the doorway, beautifully turned out, her, whatever time of evening it was. Her hair was always nicely done. She had beautiful makeup. She was always dressed. I like to see her in, in red and white because those mm. were her favorite colors, which is really nice, actually, when you think of the flag of Poland. Exactly, now. nice and patriotic there, exactly. right? Yeah. And then, you know, you'd step into her apartment, it would be so warm, it smelled of some sort of cooking, and she just had this really warm presence, always a smile on her face. Those are the memories that I have of my grandmother. What did your relationship look like, first of all, uh, as a child? She was very loving. She always uh you know took me by the hand wherever we, we we went she used to cook for me um she taught me how to make a really good lemon soup because i really like that and she you know she i felt that she really cared she really cared about her whole family um and that she wanted to set a good example for all of us mm -hmm. and she did when you were a child did you know about what she had done during the Warsaw Uprising? I mean, when did you find out about her wartime history? I think little by little, it sort of sunk in. Because as a child, you know, you're not really interested in, in what your grandparents have done or what your parents have done. You're sort of very self-centered. But I think as I grew older, 
I became more interested in, in the history of Poland, in the history of what my family had done in the mm. war times. And, you know, she used to drop into conversations when we used to come to visit her in Warsaw, drop into like conversations, little memories of, of her life back then. We'd walk through the streets of Warsaw and she'd just sort of casually say, oh, you know, you couldn't cross the road here from this point to this point because there was always a, um, a sniper on the roof over there. So you'd have to walk along the wall over here, go around the corner and then cross in front of the building. And now when I think back at that, I think, God, what a bizarre conversation to have with a grandparent, you know. And at the time, it just felt very normal because it was her remembering this sort of snippet of her life that was such a, a great part of her life. But to me, it, it, it only really kind of comes to life now that I really think about all of the sacrifices she had to make. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, what I really, what really interests me is uh, did you actually have a kind of sit-down talk with your grandmother to talk about the Warsaw Uprising or was it something which came out naturally in conversation? You're saying now that she was um, explaining how you couldn't cross a street because there were the snipers, the so-called pigeon fanciers, right, mm -hmm. uh, hidden up in the, in the tall buildings. I mean, was it something which kind of came up naturally in conversation or did you actually have a kind of sit down talk and your baptist just said well look you know let's have a sit down have a cuppa and then and she would explain what she had done you know put it all on a plate right or was it something more kind of subtle than that? It was very subtle so it came out over years you know mm. there were just moments where for example you know she mentioned that she didn't like to eat marmalade and margarine because it reminded her of what was the only thing that was available at the time and so she just hated that. Um, but there were just moments where we'd flick through family albums and she'd show me a photo and I'd ask about it but you know and she'd give me an explanation but I feel like she didn't really feel that she was a hero. She felt that her whole generation had played their part so she didn't feel unique in that way and now that we remember them you know this generation of these amazing people that fought for war so, and, and in the war, then you realise like they were unique because since then there's not been that generation that's been really tested like they were. Exactly, and they seem to be so understated, right? Mm -hmm. uh, with my uh, grandmother, with my babcha, it's a very similar kind of story that she did so many amazing things, but she didn't really talk about them mm -hmm. afterwards. She didn't feel the need to, she just did what she felt had to be done. And I rather get the impression that that's exactly what your uh, Bapcha did as well uh, during, the, um, uh, during the German occupation. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, so you were younger, you obviously got to know her. Mm -hmm. uh, did your relationship uh, evolve in any way throughout the years until, uh, until she died? She died in 2016, right? That's so right. she must have been already in her 90s. Mm -hmm. um, so can you, say like when she got older, how did your relationship evolve? I feel like we got closer um, because I was, she was always my bapcha until I became an adult and then she became Ita. She always asked me to address her as Ita. Mm -hmm. So we were two adults, you know, and I felt like we got closer in that she um, tried to understand my life and where, you know, where I was living in Qatar. She came to visit and she really enjoyed it. She loved traveling, uh, but also we just, she was such a big part of my life as I was getting married in Poland. She, she was a real central figure and she gave a lot of advice. And um, yeah, I just, our, our, our relationship changed in that way that I do feel like we got closer, you know, over the sort of adult years. Adult years, indeed. Um, looking at a, a picture of yourself and your grandmother before uh, coming in here to the library before we to record this interview, mm -hmm. um, I see a, a, a remarkable similarity mm -hmm. between uh, yourself and your and your babcha um, and also her sense of style as yours is now <laughs> of course but her sense of style as well and uh, you even wrote in the in the questionnaire for the Roots of Memory project uh, pour être belle il faut souffrir uh, so That's to be right. beautiful one has to suffer now with this uh, with this uh, vision of her standing at the top of the stairs when you used to visit and uh, how she used to, you know, her comportement, right? I mean, 
Is it something you see at the, the older generation, they just kind of managed to stand up towards all kind of difficulty and manage to kind of soldier on through and be stylish at the same time? Is she that something so that we don't have now? Stylish. She was so stylish. She just loved, I mean, she used to wear, when she went out, she wore a beret and she always loved, you know, a nice bright lipstick. Her hair was perfect. She used to go to all of the sort of like, um, secondhand clothes shops in London when she used to visit to pick out, you know, items here and there. And yeah, there was definitely a feeling that that generation held everything together, you know, even in the times when they didn't have a lot. Um, so she, I, I remember visiting um, when I was a child and there was really not very much in the shops, but she used to stand in, in queues to make sure that there was fresh milk so that I could have breakfast or fresh eggs, you know, or fresh bread because she knew that we were coming. And they really held it together. And I think that sometimes we're missing that in the generation that we have now. When you think about your Babcha, mm -hmm. can you say or can you actually pinpoint a few adjectives which come to mind straight away when you, when you think about her? Yeah, I would say brave, very, very brave and um, proud, proud of her. Proud of her country, proud of the role that she played in keeping this country together. <laughs> um, and fearless. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like I sort of I carry some of that from her influence. Um, because she was never afraid to speak up for what she knew was right. I think that influenced what I do as a for a living. Um, because she knew right from wrong, and I feel very strong, strongly that has passed down through the generations, that feeling of right and wrong, you know? Yeah, I would say those are pretty good <laughs> ways of describing her. There's a, a, a picture here, um, mm. maybe you can dig it out, of uh, her standing on um, Alea Fossa in mm -hmm. Warsaw, or no, Shucha, excuse me. There's a picture of her standing on Alea Shucha in front of a sign uh, saying Juden verboten, so Jews forbidden. Yeah. And you can actually see how almost angry she is in that picture, yeah. right? So this idea of uh, social justice, maybe you could hold it up so maybe yeah, we could, uh, the, camera, the camera can catch it. So she's there on the, the right hand side, right? With, mm -hmm. uh, is that one of her uh, family members? I think or? that was, it was uh, one of her friends. One of her friends. Um, That's her there. Yeah. When, when, when you think about her and the, how she wanted to kind of right the wrongs um, and uh, this idea of social justice, which we see so often in members of that, of that generation, you said it re just before now when it comes to, to your job. I mean, how much of your grandmother have you taken into what you do as a, as a journalist, as someone who wants to speak up for, um, let's say, social justice mm. or the wrongs in the world, so to highlight them, to try and make them right? I would say I would take a lot from my grandmother in, in terms of speaking up for what's, what's right and what's wrong. Um, she was definitely a social justice warrior in the kind of, you know, context <laughs> that we know now. Um, to go back to this, this picture, this came up in, an, in a photo album that yeah. she showed me. And I was shocked, you know, to see the, the phrase uh, for Juden verboten, Jews are forbidden to, yeah. to come to this place. I was shocked I asked her about this and she said oh, that they were walking through this area and they noticed the sign and they hadn't seen it before. I think it had come up fairly recently. They stopped to take a photo and you can see in the picture that she's really unhappy. Usually she was very smiley, but she looks furious actually, really upset and sort of furious. And I think that was a turning point for her when I asked her about this moment because she really understood how grave the situation had become. Um, and I think that that moment really brought it home, mm -hmm. you know, that, that there had to be something done now. And, and that, you know, it was, a community that had to do it together because often even now we say things have to be done but we don't do them because we expect somebody else to do them and my grandmother was one of these people that said someone has to do it and I will do it join me mm -hmm. and we'll do it together 
So I would like to say that I have that feeling that I always think, well, yeah, something has to be done and no one else is going to do it if I don't do it myself. So let's do it together, but I'll definitely start, you know. Um, so but that's probably interest, influenced my my feeling to, you know, to become a journalist. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, when I, when you think about uh, your uh, babcha, actually, no, cut that. Um, what did your babcha do after the war? All sorts of things. <laughs> so she, uh, she, when she came back, she was, she was originally um, moved, uh, up, so she was a, uh, a prisoner of war. Yep. Then she went to the UK and she was drafted into the women's RAF. Mm -hmm. uh, she met her husband there and then they came back to Poland and originally it was really difficult for them. Initially it was very difficult for them because... They came back to Warsaw? They came back to Warsaw and as she had fought in the Warsaw Uprising and my grandfather had been in the RAF uh, fighting in the Battle of Britain, they were considered as possible enemies of the, the state at the time in Poland. Mm. So it was very difficult for them to get good jobs because they weren't in the Communist Party as well. They refused to join the Communist Party. And so she um, started, I think, working in, an, uh, in the architecture. She was an architect. I know that she'd done architectural training. And I think she was working in uh, city planning an issue when she came back. So she helped rebuild Warsaw, a lot of Warsaw that had been damaged in the war. But it was a very difficult time for them. They were often taken for questioning by the authorities at the time. And with two small children in the house, she, it was a very anxious time because they didn't know if they were able to go and pick the children up from school because they were taken, you know, for questioning or if they'd be back in time to cook dinner. So. It was a difficult time for them. What led them to come back to Poland with the knowledge that uh, it might not be the best place for them considering they were already in the UK at the time? I would say two things. There was family in Warsaw, mm -hmm. but it was the Polish roots. They really believed that after fighting for Poland during the Second World War, both of them in different ways, they really felt like they should come back and build Poland, you know, from, from the ground up, literally from the ground up in my grandmother's case. Yeah. Um, they felt very strong roots in Poland. Yeah, it's as simple as that, right? Very simple. And uh, so she worked as an architect. And did, do you know or do you feel that she took her wartime experiences and applied them to her job and her uh, profession as well? That I actually don't know. I don't know much about this post-war period, you okay. know, of, of her life. Um, I would say the attitude of no-nonsense attitude that she must have had, because obviously things were very difficult during the, the war. She had this very no-nonsense attitude to most things. So she, uh, when she was back in Warsaw, she helped her fellow um, Povsteinse, fellow uh, fighters, insurgents, I guess. Insurgents, yes. Insurgents, exactly. Mm -hmm. She f helped her fellow insurgents make sure that they had uh, the right benefits. She held meetings and group with the groups of these insurgents. Uh, but she had this no-nonsense attitude. So she used to hate, in the beginning, going to these meetings because they'd take like three hours and everyone would sit, have a coffee, a cigarette. And even though she was a smoker, she just said, right, enough, no cigarette, no smoking at these meetings. And then all of a sudden the meetings would take only 30 minutes because everyone was just like, desperate to get out for a cigarette, you know, she's just like, don't waste my time, you know, I want to get this meeting done, let's go all home. So she had this no-nonsense attitude through her whole life, and mm -hmm. I think uh, I'm quite plain speaking as well because of that. I think a lot of people from that generation generally tend to be very plain speaking and upfront. Um, my babcha as well was a smoker and we had a great times uh, sitting for, for, for coffee and cigarettes and, and discussing life, uh, whether it be family now or her wartime experiences. I mean, you were saying that uh, earlier uh, she didn't really kind of sit you down and talk through everything. Um, but when the first, when when did you kind of manage to create a, a fuller image of what your grandmother or your, what your babcha did during the war? Because you're saying that here we have the snipers, here we have, you know, little tidbits of information mm -hmm. which she was taking from all over the place. I mean, 
How long did it take for you to actually create a, an image of, of what she had done during the, during the uprising? I mean, did she give you any kind of concrete examples of what she did? It was probably around 2010 because I was getting ready to get married in mm -hmm. Poland and we'd invited maybe 150 people to this wedding in Poland. And the night before the wedding, it was my grandmother's birthday. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to present her with a cake, make a speech and introduce her to everybody and what she'd done. And so I started researching a bit about what she'd achieved in her life and, yeah. and her time during the Warsaw Uprising. And it really surprised me because I, I started, it was like a jigsaw puzzle sort of coming together. There was mm -hmm. a piece here and a piece there that I remember hearing. And all of a sudden it, it created this life that I had heard about but hadn't put together. Mm -hmm. So the night before the wedding, I stood up, made a speech, presented her with a cake. And afterwards, she was approached by so many of my friends from all over the world. So there were Australians, um, British, from all over the place had come up and were taking photos with her and asking her about her life. And mm. I was so proud. She pulled me over at the end of the night and said, thank you so much for that. Um, I've actually never been presented with a cake, birthday cake on my birthday. The only time I can think about being presented with a birthday cake was when I was a prisoner of war, someone had kept a piece of bread and put a match or a candle or something in yeah, it. Yeah. And she said, and that was the first time that someone had actually brought me a cake for my birthday and wished me a happy birthday. So that was kind of the moment that really crystallized all those memories. Sure, sure, sure. So I would like to talk a little bit about uh, what your Bapcha was like uh, at home. And you said, uh, and you've written that she was a woman of style. We've, we've uh, spoken about how she was always very stylish and that to be beautiful, one has to suffer. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned uh, a little something to do with culinary. Uh, you mentioned a little something about um, Polish cuisine, right? Mm -hmm. And the fact that she taught you how to make Zupa Cytrynowa, so mm -hmm. uh, lemon soup. Now e explain what this lemon soup is and why it's so important for you and your family. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. my bachelor was very resourceful. You know, she had a teeny tiny kitchen because she lives in this apartment in the old town of Warsaw and there's not much space. Uh, but she was very resourceful. She had jars and, and little boxes all the way up to the ceiling with all sorts of different things. And she used to knock out amazing dinners, you know, out of, out of this tiny kitchen. And once she made this um, lemon soup, which is sort of sounds a bit bizarre to, I think, anyone who doesn't have Polish, you know, roots. Right. But it's incredibly tasty, and I've made it since then for many of my friends. And this lemon soup, she passed on her, she verbally told me the recipe, and I wrote it down uh, in broken Polish. And then she read it back, and I can still remember her laughing. It was so badly written, because my, po my written Polish at the time was not very good, that she just laughed and laughed and laughed. And that, that dish now really represents my grandmother, because it's, it's sort of summery, it's light, it's happy. It's a really great soup, but it just has that memory as well. I was going to say tangy and zesty. Are those tangy adjectives which would work with your babcha, do you I think? I think so. Tangy and zesty and punchy, absolutely. <laughs> punchy, absolutely. Um, when you think about your babcha and um, members of that generation, especially from Poland, what do you think our generation can learn uh, as the grandchildren of uh, the Warsaw insurgents? What do you think we can learn from them? I think that generation were very community minded, um, socially justice, social justice was very high on their agenda, agenda right, yeah. exactly. Um, they didn't complain, they did the best with what they could ha find, they were resourceful. Um, I think our generation has probably lost some of that. We like to complain. Yes. We're not very resourceful. <laughs> um, I think the next generation, I'm hopeful that the next generation has got it right. I see so many changes now in terms of social justice, mm -hmm. standing up for what's right and what's wrong, that you could see in my grandmother's generation. Um, I hope that we've passed it down, it's just perhaps we didn't have the opportunity to speak up as much as the next generation has. Yeah. Okay. Um, are you... Um 
Do you have children, right? I have cho two children, yeah. Okay, okay. So with your children, are you also taking some of those things which you took from your BAPCHA and then passing them on for the, for the next generation? Absolutely. My children know the history that they have, the family history, and they know that they come from a long line of fighters people who stand up for what's right and wrong. Mm. I say that every day to them. I tell them every day when they go to school, they must stand up for what's right and wrong. If they see injustice in the playground, you know, <laughs> that they have to speak up and they have to stand up for the person who may be bullied or maybe called names or being picked on. And I know that my children are doing that and that makes me really proud because I, I like to pass on that from my bapcha down through the generations. This is being they my Bapcha's grandchildren and the teachers tell me that the children are, are very good like that, that they stand up for their friends. Mm -hmm. I think that's so important. Do you think you have to have um, relatives or let's say predecessors in the Povstanie Warszawskie, in the Warsaw Uprising, in order to have this kind of social justice streak? Um, I get, kind of get the feeling that uh, the people that I know, whether it be here in Poland or abroad, but who have relatives who fought in the Warsaw Uprising, there's just something about them, right, which makes mm -hmm. them more um, kind of fight for this uh, social justice against injustices uh, and uh, for, a, for a better place for everyone. Have you seen that as well with, let's say, uh, with the people that you know who may have family in the Warsaw Uprising? I would say that's probably true, actually. I, I think that there's always in the back of your mind that if you don't stand up for what's, if you don't stand up for what's right in that moment, that you never know where the line is going to go. You know, it's going to keep going and keep going and keep going. And we've seen in the past, you know, our gen our relatives have lived through these awful times that you've got to stop. You've got to stop the rot, you know, when you can. You've got to make sure that. Once you see something wrong, you've got to speak out that moment. Otherwise, you don't know how far it's going to go. And mm. I think that's maybe like a generational thing that we've been taught over the years through our parents and our grandparents. So I think that's, that's true, that when you have relatives in, in the Warsaw Uprising, you have this feeling of, of social justice because it's something that's generational. Mm. Um, and without that, I don't know where we'd be. My last question for you would be, if there's anything you would like to say to members of, let's say, our generation or the younger generations about what we can take away from people, from insurgents who fought in the Warsaw Rising, uh, what would that be? What would you say? I would say stand up for what you know is right. Yeah. Because that's the most important thing. And don't expect other people to do it for you. You have to do it yourself, just like the insurgents did. They were just normal people. They were normal people, they were young people, they had their whole lives ahead of them, and they weren't afraid in the end, knowing that they could die to stand up for what's right. And I would say, we don't, we're not tested as much. Our generation is not tested as much as they were. But that doesn't mean we don't have to stand up for everything that's right. So we can take a card out of their book, as they say in Polish, to use a very badly one-to-one <laughs> -one translated yeah. idiom there. Um, Joanna Gonszorowska Brandl, uh, many thanks for coming uh, here to Warsaw and to be interviewed for the Roots of Memory project uh, at the Warsaw Rising Museum. Uh, and of course, uh, you can find more videos by going to uh, the Warsaw Rising Museum uh, YouTube, uh, where there'll be plenty of interviews, both in Polish and in English, waiting there for you. Thanks once again. Thank you.